Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm excited about uh, sharing the word with you today. And so let's, I'm just going to read from Luke in this popular story that you've heard many times, and it's nothing new. It, it's going to begin in chapter 2, verses, again at verse 4. It says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and, and into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great, great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swallowing clothes, and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We praise your holy name as we celebrate this time, this event. Lord, I pray you would just mold our hearts and prepare them to receive what you would have us receive today. Lord, you are so precious in all that you do. Lord, we want to have that time of preciousness with you, that time of fellowship, that time of remembering everything that you've done for us, Lord, because you are precious. And Lord, we pray that you will be glorified today, and we just say this in your precious name, amen. Now, this is my Christmas message, but it's also my New Year's message, because I want to challenge you. But I want to talk about the lessons of Christmas, and you've heard them many times. And, but we need to remember those lessons, and sometimes we need to look at them because there's so many of them. Now the greatest lesson, the greatest event that we need to understand is that Jesus was God who came in the flesh. I mean, we talk about wrapped presents, you have to realize that deity was wrapped in humanity. Now that's an incredible thought. But he wasn't just wrapped in humanity. He was, uh, they said, formed as a servant and fashioned as a man in a womb. Now that's the core of the Christmas message. That Jesus Christ came in the flesh. God in the flesh. Deity in flesh. Totally the manifestation of God. And he came through an unusual way. He came through a manger. And he left by way of a cross. You have to have all that together to really understand the significance of Christmas. Because Jesus as a babe may be a sentimental understanding, but that's not what it's all about. It's like uh, Carrie's song says, he was born to die. He was born to die. He had to take on that very humanity so he could become the Lamb of God. Now, we can debate all of whether he was born in December or in, and in fall and all these things. But you know what we are celebrating today is not a day, it's an event. It's a reality that God stepped into the midst of humanity to address our sin problem. That's what we're recognizing. That's what we're remembering. And, and we should remember it every day. But sometimes we just need to take time. And grab a hold of those events that took place that he was born of a virgin. So that he could become the sinless lamb of God and satisfy the judgment of law. That was upon all mankind. That judgment people was death. We were walking under condemnation. And until you receive Christ, you continue to be under that condemnation of death. Now, you have to realize that Jesus was clothed in humanity and became a sin offering so we could be made in the righteousness of God. Now, that's a very th good thing for you to remember because I'm going to be talking a little bit about that more so later on. That we need to be made in the righteousness of God because we are not acceptable in our state. That's why we have to be born again. That's why we have to have a new disposition, a new heart. Because we're not accepted in our present state. Now, like I was talking about, it was an event. It's not a day we celebrate. It's an event that we celebrate. 
And when you look at our Christian life, that relates to the fact that we're born again. How many of you realize that born again is an event? It's something that happens to you. It's something that occurs in your life. If you're not born again, Jesus said what? You will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not that simple. It's, it's that simple. People are running around talking about being saved, but the question is, are you born again? Are you truly born again of that life in Christ in you? Now, we know that what God did, He did out of love. That's another lesson. He gave out of love. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. What does this show us? It shows us that if something comes, anything comes from any other area but a heart of love, it's not acceptable. If things don't come out of a heart of love, it's not acceptable. There's no eternal mark on it. And that love is only understood in light of the cross. The next lesson we can understand is he gave his best. He gave his best. You know, one thing I see, even about myself, is I throw bones at God once in a while. I give the leftovers. I give that which is tainted because it's an easy thing to do. But you know what? God deserves our best. He gave our be his best. He gave his best. And you know, the only way we can give our best is consecrate ourselves. Consecrate ourselves totally to his work and his purpose. That's the only way we can ensure the best comes out of our life. And finally, the gift he gave. The gift was eternal life. And that shows us we must give our lives as well. We must give our total life to him and let him have his way. Now those are the, those are the lessons that we know up front. But there's another lesson, actually four of them, that has to do with discipleship. In the Christmas story is the greatest lessons on discipleship you can imagine. But you have to know what you're looking at. And those greatest lessons are found in the four examples I always give are four reactions to the birth of Christ. The innkeeper, the shepherds, Herod, and the wise men. Now, I always use them in relationship to the idea of salvation. But it also shows us in relationship to discipleship. Now, what did Jesus say? He said what? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, when we look at these four examples, you're going to see how that discipleship lesson are actually in their examples, one way or the other. Now, let's look at the innkeeper. That's the first response. Now, it just said that uh, there was no room for Jesus in the end. So we assume the innkeeper turned him away. Someone had to turn him away, turn the parents away. The question is, why did the innkeeper turn him away? Well, it's very simple, something called the world. The innkeeper was so caught up with the world that when this very opportunity stood before him. He missed it. He missed it. You see what the innkeeper shows us is if the world has a great influence in our life, guess what? We're going to miss the opportunities when it comes to our life in Christ. We're going to miss it. Now, when you're a Christian, you may not be blinded like this man. This man was totally blinded by the world. He totally had no spiritual sense about him. He totally didn't know what was going on. And you know what? He didn't care, probably. He just saw a pregnant woman and said, Okay, my best solution is you go over there. Was he a mean man? I don't think he was a mean man. But he was a man that was blinded. So what happens to Christians when they get caught up with the world too much? What happens when Christians allow the world in too much? Does it blind them? No, it doesn't. What it does is dull them down. It dulls them down. The world will dull you down. It will make you unreceptive. It will make you unresponsive. And when 
opportunity knocks at the door for you to do something for Christ, you're not going to be prepared to do anything for Christ. Because you're dulled down. You're in a comatose state. You could be even totally asleep. One of my great examples of that is Jonah. God told Jonah, go do this. Do you think the discipleship command is an option? He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That's not an option. That's a command. But how many of us, when we hear that command, are we, uh, are we decide we're Christians, but we decide that's not really something I need to do? How many of us go to sleep? How many of us run and hide in the, in the bottom of our pews? Or maybe we're growing roots in our pews. But we're a lot like Jonah. We're laying in the bottom of the, she of the ship. We're asleep. And here's the ship ready to go down because God's after Jonah. How many Christians are, is God after? And how much is he trying to shake the church? How much is, is the very gates of hell knocking against the church doors and we're sitting there saying, I'm okay, I'm okay. And basically we're asleep. And when we're asleep, you don't care. You don't care if people are going to hell. You don't care what's happening out there because you know what? It doesn't matter to you. And that's what the world does to us. The world dolls us down. The world makes us a bunch of Jonas, totally disobedient to the command and our call to be a disciple. It dolls us down. It makes us inconsistent. Today, I believe a lot of people are asleep in the church pews. They're asleep because they do enough religious works that they think that they're throwing bones at God. And God says, you're missing it. And he comes and he knocks at the door and he says, I have something for you to do. And they're totally asleep and unresponsive. You know what the world does? You know what the greatest crime the world does besides create idolatry in our life? The world prevents us from seeing the opportunities to serve God. That's the bottom line. You will not be prepared to serve God. You'll miss the opportunities. You'll miss that which is bigger than anything you can imagine. Now how about the shepherds? Well, we like the shepherds, Why? right? We like to think we're like them. They're out there in the mountain, they're in the darkness, mining their sheep. And what do they receive? Well, I call it a vision, right? They get a vision of heaven. Angels singing, praising God. You talk about waking them up, right? But what did those angels do? They said, go. Go! And see that child. Go! What is the commission to disciples? Go! Go! Preach! There's nothing inactive about what God has told us to do. He has called us to what? Be active. To go. To tell people, to share pe with people what Christ has done for us. We may not be great Bible scholars, but if you sit here saved today, you have a testimony that you can share. And if God is having His way, you have a, you have a testimony about how He changed your life. How He made it different. How He made it unique. But you have to respond, you have to realize that these shepherds were considered what? Insignificant. These shepherds show us that the only way we can respond to the things of God is from a, a state of humility. That those shepherds, in the scheme of things, didn't mean anything to society as a whole. But you know what? They were open and they were ready to respond. They were in a state of humility. But they were also in a way, in, in, in a readiness to, to, to obey. And they did it because it began with a vision. You know what I think is wrong with the church today? I think it lacks vision. If you ask me what the church needs today as far as vision, I think what the church needs as far as vision is to realize that they're the only ones standing between people and hell. 
and that there's an urgency there. And maybe we're not meant to preach the gospel like some great evangelist, but people, we need to avail ourselves so God can use us, however He chooses. But we need a vision. That vision woke up those shepherds if they were half asleep. Something needs to wake up the church. It's going to take a powerful vision. And still some people aren't going to wake up. It's just the way it is. Because you know why? They don't want to. They don't have the mind to wake up. But there's people there in between that stage. And I think we need a vision. And you know what, what uh, the wisest man Solomon said? Without a vision, people perish. Because they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They don't have any purpose. And so they said, go! Go! If you're truly born again, it's because you received the truth of what? A message. The gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And what is your responsibility? To go. But we oftentimes have to have a vision. And for me, it took a vision of hell to really wake me up to the urgency of our mission on earth. You know, God didn't leave us here to live a life. He left us here to be a witness. And sometimes we forget that. You know, when it comes to discipleship, what we can learn from the shepherds is that it takes a vision to awaken us to important matters. But we must be prepared to react, to follow, to obey what the message tells us to do. How about the next person? Well, the next person is Herod. We don't like this guy, right? But I want you to know something about Herod. He was part of the world. So what does that mean? Herod was asleep. He was asleep. He had no idea what was happening. He was asleep. He was content in his world. But all of a sudden, Herod's awaken. What awoke Herod? Was it a vision? No. You know what awoke Herod? Jealousy. Jealousy awoke Herod. He became jealous. He got excited because somebody else might intrude in his whole kingdom. That's what awoke Herod. It's jealousy. Do you realize that most people who are asleep in the world is only awakened by jealousy? That's the only thing that wakes them up. Don't intrude in my reality. Don't try to step on me. Don't be better than me. Don't be more important than me. You know what's sad? That a lot of times when I sit and watch Christians being awakened, they're awakened by their jealousy, not by a vision or a greater calling. They see their little world, Christian world, however they look at it, being shaken or somebody's going to be competing with them and they stand up. And how does jealousy affect us? Well, for us, we need to know jealousy is part of pride goes back to the great idol pride. And that's all that's being awakened in this is our pride, our arrogance, our need to be someone. And so if we as Christians don't recognize jealousy in our life, we're in trouble. Because we all have jealousy. And I have felt jealousy. Is there anybody here that hasn't felt jealousy? It's a torment, isn't it? It just drives you crazy. As Christians, we're supposed to repent and deal with that jealousy and not give it any room. But you know what? Most people won't deal with jealousy. They'll look around and justify it. And you know where jealousy will take you there from that point? Rage. Anger and rage. That's where jealousy will take you. So when you see a lot of anger and rage in, the, in, in Christians, you know what happened? Their jealousy was awakened. And instead of repenting, they have justified and gone the way of rage. Anger and rage. And they're going to sacrifice somebody in the way, just like Herod sacrificed all their children, to try to maintain his stupid little kingdom. 
And jealousy will always sacrifice. Jealousy will always throw people under the bus. Jealousy that comes out on top will always cause sorrow and despair in the end. That's the reality of Herod. His kingdom was shaken by what was going on around him that there was possibly another king. You know what? Jesus wasn't threatening his kingdom. But look at all those poor innocent children that died because of his jealousy. Look at the Pharisees. You know what awoke the Pharisees? Jealousy. You know why they crucified Jesus? Jealousy. Because you know what? Jealousy doesn't care about truth. Jealousy will crucify the truth so it still can be right and come out on top. I want you to consider what Romans 11.11 11 says because I think this pretty well shows you that this is how jealousy works. I say then, have they stumbled, this is talking about the Jews, that they should fall. God forbid. It says, but rather through their full fall, salvation's come to the Gentiles. In other words, he says, because, and you have to recognize in, the, in verses around it, it talks about the, the Jews having a slumbering spirit. And, then, and, and it says that because they have fallen and their slumbering spirit, it's because now we can be saved. Okay, Gentiles can be saved. But notice what he said that he was going to do, how he's going to use the Gentiles. He goes on to say, for to provoke them to jealousy. He's saying, I'm going to use the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy, to wake them up because they're slumbering. But in this case, it's to bring them back to himself. Now, we have to remember that such jealousy is a part of the works of the flesh. It will not inherit the kingdom of God. Nothing good will come out of it. Yet how many people will still ride on their je jealousies? Now, Satan will always use the avenue of the world to doll you down to your spiritual opportunities. He will use pride in you to fight against or silence the things of heaven. Today, many servants of God have been hindered and attacked because some sleeping Christians were awakened by jealousy and fell into the trap of their pride. Now, we know jealousy or envy is a product of the world's form of wisdom or reasoning. According to James 3.15, it says, this wisdom, meaning talking about envy and jealousy, descendeth not from above, but from but is earthly, sensual, and devilishly, or, or demonic. Now the final response we have is the wise men, right? What can we learn from the wise men as far as disciples? Well, the wise men were aware of the signs in the sky. People, there's all kinds of signs. And we better wake up and be aware of them. Okay? Because guess what? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And all those signs are telling us that. They recognize the signs. And they follow that star because guess what? They were seeking out the king. People, they were wise because they sought out the king. They were wise because they found him. You know why we're not wise today? Because we're not seeking out the king. You know why we remain fools? Because we, we haven't found him. That's the reality of it. And most people are sold to accept a title or an idea rather than seek after and embrace the person of Jesus for themselves. Seek Him with everything in their heart and everything in them and they won't be content till they find Him. People, we have to find Christ in the darkness. We have to find Him in the everyday life. We have to find Him in everything if anything is going to make sense to us. 
You want to know why life doesn't make sense? Because people won't find Jesus in it. He's the only thing that makes sense out of anything. And if you're wise, you're seeking Him today. And if you're not a fool, it's because you found Him. And you do that every day of your life, not just once in a while. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And He shall seek me and find me when you, when you shall search for me with all your heart. As you can see, there are lessons in these four examples. They do show us about discipleship. They show us about our walk, what to be aware of. Now, I've been reading authors from the 1500s and the 1700s. And when I read these people's writings, you know what? I get scared to death because I think, man, I am so far away from the mark. They make me realize how narrow the way is. And why few find the way. The way is not religious affiliation. The way is not religious work. The way is the person of Christ. We don't get him right. We don't find him. If we don't follow him. Because discipleship is all about following him into the life he's calling us to. If we're not doing that, we're not walking this narrow way. It's that simple. As I was thinking about the lessons of Christmas and how Christians can fall into the innkeeper and the Herod's camps, as we would call it, as well as the other two, I had to ask myself, why? What's the key today? If I could look at the church, what is lacking today? in the church. Because people, when I read Acts, the church I see in America is not lining up. It's just not there. There's no power. There's no authority. And it's like, well, that's okay that we have no power and authority as long as we keep on, what, doing our regular little duties every Sunday. My, my sentiment is, if the Holy Spirit's not there, then why are you even doing anything? If God is not there, why are you not doing, why are, why are you there? Because we should go to church to do business with God. Not just, just to go through some religious motions. And if God's not there, we should be so upset. We should be so distressed that we get on our face and we stay on our face until we find out why He's not there. Why he's not moving. Why people's souls are not being saved. Why people aren't being healed. Why people aren't, aren't being changed. People, that's what the gospel is all about. Why is it not happening? And that's why I've asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to understand why we're failing here. Now, I, I can have, you know, I have my ideas. Well, I was reading it. Uh, Charles Finney's book on, uh, it's called Lectures on Revival and Religion. And what Finney said, I understood most of it. The first thing, that any great revival, any, where any move of the Holy Spirit takes place, begins at the point of repentance. It all begins at repentance. I understand it. Now repentance is what? It's turning. It's turning away from where you're walking and, and facing God. It's changing your mind. It's changing your attitude. It's changing everything. That's what repentance is. Okay? And I understand that. Now the reason that I think Finney is a really good man to read is because his success rate and that they, they basically base success rate on how many people 10 or 15 years down the line still maintain their life in God. So what they found out 10 to 15 years later is that 85% saved under his revivals were still walking in the ways of God. Now that's success. So what was the key to success? Is success be besides repentance. And then I read another word. Now I've heard this word. I have talked about this word. I've written about this word. But well, he brought a whole new take on it. And the word is conversion. Conversion. You see, the biggest problem in our churches today in America is that many people sitting in those pews are not converted. It's that simple. They're not converted. 
Repentance is a matter of turning around. But why would you turn around? To be converted. That's why you turn around. You are turning around to be converted. To what? To righteousness. To the ways of righteousness. That's why you're repenting. Is you are repenting to convert. It's that simple. So here's what I learned from Charles Finney. He said that the way they trained their people when there was a revival, the leaders, is that when somebody got saved, they had a lot of sin in their life. I mean, tons of sins in their life. They got saved. You know, they led them through the sinner's prayer. They encouraged them. They gave them instructions. But he said, when these people went back out in the world and they began to struggle with sin again, they struggle with sin again, because guess what? God doesn't clean you up overnight. Doesn't work that way. Okay? So they would come back to these leaders and they would say, you know, I'm having a problem. What do we do today when people who are in sin come to us and say we're having a problem? You know what we do today? We give them a pass. That's what we do. Oh, God loves you. You're saved. You're okay. They didn't say that to them. You need to deal with it. You need to deal with it. You need to make sure you're converted. And so they'd have to go and they'd wrestle with it and wrestle with it until they repented of it and got converted to what was right. And so they had to go through layers and layers. You know, when we first get saved, that's the initial layer. But I'm going to tell you, there's 50 layers after that. And you know what? At every layer, you need to be converted. You need to be converted. You're not converted there. That's why you're having a problem. Conversion means change of attitude. Change of how you do it. Change to righteousness. Agree with God demanding righteousness. You cannot give people a pass in sin. And you know what we use to give people a pass in sin? God loves you. Well, let me tell you about love. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Love doesn't turn the other way from iniquity. Love confronts it. And out of love, I say, you need to be converted. You need to deal with that problem. I'm not giving you a pass. My love won't let you. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus Christ. If he was going to give us a pass, he wouldn't have died on the cross. You know, he could say, oh, well, as long as you have faith, I'll send you to paradise. You know what the problem with paradise was? It wasn't the presence of God. Think about what I'm saying. I'm not saying the presence wasn't there. But because of what Christ did on the cross, guess what? Paradise was empty. And where are our saints now? In the presence of God. God could have gave you a pass, but you would have never been in His presence either. Because God is holy, and He will not turn His back on sin. So my challenge for the new year is, there's a struggle in your life, I can tell you what's wrong right now. You need to be converted. And that conversion will usually start with what? Repentance. Owing up. Owning. And saying, this is not right. You know, God says there's not much we can hate in this world. We're to love our enemies. I'll tell you one thing He does say we hate, and that is sin. We are to hate sin in our lives. Because of what it does to us. Because sin will keep us from being converted to righteousness and entering into the presence of God. So I'm going to give you some ideas about what we need to be converted from today. I'm going to talk about some of the layers. And I'm not going to hit all of them. I'm going to hit some of them. The first layer we all understand. The first layer is sin itself. We commit sins. I came to Christ because I couldn't stand the sins of my life. And I need someone to forgive me and cleanse me. Oh, that was a beautiful liberty. It lasted for what? About a couple of months. But here comes the next layer. 
And you know what's the problem today in the church in America? Is that most people never get to that second layer. Oh, well, my sins are taken care of. They never get to that second layer. They're given a pass. They're given the pass after the first layer. Think about what I'm saying. So what's the second layer that I had to recognize? I had to recognize that I was a sinner. You know, we have a way of divorcing ourselves from the fact that the reason we have sins is because we're a sinner. Huh? You know, today people are running around, God hates your sins, but he loves you. Baloney, you're the sinner. You're the one doing it. Sin is coming from you. He's not separating it. He wants you to deal with it. Jesus had two sacrifices for sin on the cross. One was for our sins. It's called a trespass offering. That's where I, am, I commit trespasses against God. But the other one was a sin offering. You know what that sin offering addressed? My sinful nature. I became sin so I could be made in the righteousness of God. That's the issue right there. I'm a sinner. I am inclined to sin. I have a disposition in me that's contrary to God. And that disposition has to be taken care of. It has to be confronted. I have to be converted to the character of God, to the ways of God. Now the next thing I have to deal with, okay, and now I'm a sinner. Okay, I'm a sinner. I want you to know when I, I was saved, I wanted to believe there's something good in me. How many of you want to believe it? That you had something to offer to God. Oh, there's something good in me. Surely there is. And when you realize you're a sinner, you think, well, you know, I have to admit, I think these things and I do these things and I'm the one with the problem. The sin's not the problem. I'm the problem. The sin is a manifestation of me being the problem. It's that simple. But then I have to go the next step. I have to say, you know what? There is no good thing in my flesh. There is absolutely no good thing in my flesh. In other words, anything that comes out of my flesh is not going to be beneficial. It's not going to benefit me or anybody else around me. Do you know how hard that is to come to that truth? You mean I have to say, God, there's really nothing you can use in me? Yeah. There is no good thing in you. You have to come to terms with that before you're going to be converted to doing it God's way. Because as long as you do it according to the flesh, you are doing things that are going to ultimately end in what? Defeat and corruption. And you have to come to that. You have to be converted in that area. I'm a sinner and I need to be converted to the ways of God because there's nothing good in my flesh. Now the next thing that we have to have conversion in is our intentions. Oh, I have the best intentions. God, surely we can see. I'm really trying hard. I'm really trying hard. No, you're trying hard to do it in your own strength. You're trying hard to come out and look good. You're trying hard to say, oh, these are good intentions. Certainly God will accept it. When all the way, all the time, you have this independence you don't want to give up. That's all good intentions are, is hiding this fierce independence of rights, of what I think I deserve. That's all it is. And when you can finally say, my best intentions can be compared to the saying, and I'm sure you've heard of it, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But they're not going to measure up. Because they're coming out of your flesh and out of your strength. And yeah, you're trying in your own strength. And you are sufficing yourself. But I hate to tell you, God's not pleased with you. Because if He tells you to do something, He enables you to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is not going to be an excuse. 
And these little intentions you throw at him will be filthy rags, perversion before him, and he will not accept them. We walk by faith, not by our own understanding. Now the next thing I have to come to, and this is a hard one, is my affections. My affections. The Bible says my affections have to be turned upward. And you know, the reason I have to turn my affections upward, because that's the only way I'm going to discipline my attractions down here. So much of the world, world, world attracts me because I'm looking at for purpose and meaning instead of up this way, setting my affections up, up there so that I can discipline my attractions down here. We wonder why we're, we're so in trouble with the world because we have not disciplined the attractions because we will not set our affections where they're supposed to be. Now here's a big one, my works. I want you to know if your works don't originate with God, they're reprobate. If he's not honoring them, if he is not ordaining them, they're reprobate. They're going to be cast away. Well, you don't understand, God. I've done all this stuff for you. How many of you read Matthew 7? It says, I've done all this in your name. And what did he say? I don't know you, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because you weren't doing the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? That he's the one that's doing the good work in you. You're not. It's got to be ordained by him, not by you. Oftentimes our idea of works are a bunch of religious nonsense that we throw at God. Well, I'm going to church. That's not a work. That is your reasonable service. You go to church because you need that for yourself. It has nothing to do with God. Well, I'm reading the Bible. You do that for yourself because that's your meat. That's your food. Well, I'm praying you do that for yourself because that's the point of personal edification. Most of the things we do is about me, myself, and I. It has nothing to do with serving God. Works are things that are ordained by God, and I do them out of obedience to God. Now we're getting down to the next one. It's a big one. My motive. Why I do the things I do. Why do I do it? Most of the time we do it because we're selfish. Let's just face it. We're selfish. I do it because it's going to make me look good, make me feel good. It's going to make me this, make me that has nothing to do with God. Those motives are down in the very basement and abyss of who we are as Christians. They're self-serving. And that's why Jesus, that's why Isaiah the prophet said, your best is as filthy rocks because they come from the basement of base pagan selfishness. And they're unacceptable to God. So I got to get my motive right to make sure I'm doing what God wants me to do in order to make sure that my affections are right before God to maintain a pure heart so that I can make sure that my intentions are not just intentions. They are what God intended and that if a God intends it, then I can be sure that I can put down my flesh and then I can also deal with the old man in me. It is a process. But it's always going to bring you down to your motives. You know, there's nothing I can offer God. There's nothing I can offer God unless God put it there in me. And if I cannot offer God what God has put in me, then I might as well keep it. Because it's not going to do me a bit of good. And what has God given you? He's given you His Son. He's given you the life of His Son. So you can live His life. And so when He are required of it, you give His life back. But it's a life untainted. It's a life purified. It's a life inflamed by the Holy Spirit. Passion. Commitment. Because we can't give Him any less than the way He did for us. It's a work of the Spirit. I have nothing to offer apart from God. His work and what His Spirit has done in my life. It requires me to constantly be honest with myself so I can repent, so I can be converted to His way of thinking. 
this coming year, I want, I want to challenge you to make sure you're converted. That you're being converted every day of your life to that which is righteous, acceptable to God. If not, we need to avail ourselves, wherever we're not converted, we need to avail ourselves to God in humility, repent of the wrong influences in our life, whether it's the world or the flesh or Satan. And then be converted to the ways of righteousness. That's what we need to do in 2014. And I'll tell you why. Time is short. And I believe only those who are truly converted are going to be able to stand and withstand the great temptations and darkness that's coming on the world. And we're just getting a taste of it. This is a glimpse, people. I believe the darkness is going to be greater. And it's only by having that right standing and walking in righteousness before God can we stand. It's only by ensuring our testimony can we withstand everything, all hell coming against us. And whenever everything else is done, we will continue to stand because we know God's worth it. That's my challenge. Let's word prayer. Lord, there's so much that can be said. But only your Holy Spirit can turn on the light and enlighten our hearts. Waken us mentally, emotionally, spiritually to what you want to do and accomplish. That we won't sell for less. That we will desire the best. And that when all of hell comes against us, we'll be able to stand. Because of our life hidden in you. Because we stand in a righteous place with you. Confident of our salvation. Assured of our testimony. And growing in our revelation of you. May we never sell for second best. May we always pursue that which is priceless and precious to you heart, your heart, Lord. I thank you for these people. Their hearts are tender towards you. I pray that you uh, speak to their hearts based on what you want to, whether it's an encouragement or whether it's you, they're wrestling with something that you bring perspective to them or whatever that's going on in their life, Lord. You know. But Lord, you're worthy of our best. Help us, enable us, make sure that whatever we offer is of you, ordained by you, consecrated, sanctified, consecrated to you, sanctified by you. And that in the end, you will be able to receive it as that precious gift of faith. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We ask that you continue to minister to us the rest of this week. We thank you for this time to be together and think about the event that allowed your son to come into this world and make that incredible difference to bring forth that salvation and the opportunity to walk in that narrow path of righteousness. And so we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we just say this in your precious name. Amen.